All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to this last uh, event of this very, very busy schedule. Um, we're going to have a roundtable discussion. Now, I must say, I imagined when we were having a roundtable discussion, it would actually be a big round table, but four smaller roundtables, I guess, will have to suffice for today. Um, and the goal of this discussion is to think about new ideas where the future of meta-organism research is going. Okay. However, we're all scientists here. And we were all a bit worried that we would very quickly go into all kinds of negative topics like what we did wrong and stuff like that. So we decided to come up with an icebreaker question that would remind us what it is like to be a scientist, what it, what it, it would just remind us of what it is like not to know. So we're going to pose a question to you first. Um, and it is a rather difficult question. So if you need time to think about it, let us know, because I have prepared my answer. <laughs> And the question is, what are you currently convinced of in microbiome research that perhaps you wouldn't have believed 10 or 20 years ago? Oh, cool question. Oh. Sorry, I don't want to answer. <laughs> I would like to also remind you, you have a microphone. Actually. Oh, okay. It's here on the table. Uh, these are just for the recording. So can you please use the microphone on the table here if you're going to speak up? Let me call. All right, um, what I find, uh, first of all, thanks for a great question. Really, um, uh, very, um, lot to think about. I think uh, that as I experienced the field 20 years ago, uh, the assumption that there's any kind of causality between the microbiome and a host uh, was assumed almost silly. Um, and I think that one of the greatest advances in the field has been the understanding of the importance of the microbiome, that simply. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> so, so I think Nicole and I probably both feel that when we started our careers, we were what might have been considered a backwater field. In other words, the field of symbiosis was symbiosis, the interaction of microbes with animals and plants was considered to be a very rare situation. And so, you know, it was one of those things that, um, you know, you, it was luminous bacteria and hydrothermal vent animals and nitrogen fixing bacteria in plants and so on. And then all of a sudden, next gen sequencing came around. And Karen Gillerman invited me to give a seminar at, at Oregon. And she was beginning, after doing a postdoc at Stanford, she was beginning in, as a junior professor to study the microbiome of zebrafish. And it was one of those situations where you could just see this field enabled by next-gen sequencing exploding. <laughs> Yeah, this is a very good question. <clears throat> Just to think about it, I mean, I'm a bacteriologist, so I'm probably having a bit of a different background than the others here. Thinking 20 or 25 years back, uh, or even less, um, as a bacteriologist, you, you are trained to look at specific bacterial species, model organisms, and at their properties. That this is all in a bigger context is something that emerged only in the last couple of years, I would say. In Germany, we have these annual conferences of microbiology. So and there are even two. One is the medical and one is the general microbiology. And until a couple of years ago, microbiome science has never been a major topic in these audiences. So it tells you that microbiome science and, and meta-organism science has hardly been shaped by micro microbiologists. Yeah? It came all from the other side. And many of the leading figures in the field, they are mat mathematicians or immunologists, or they come from a clinical discipline with a patient cohort, and then they adapted all the methodology to uh, start this type of science. Yeah? I think we bacteriologists in tubing, we have um, adopted it a bit. We're only starting to really uh, recognize it and yeah i'm happy to be here and bring my background learn a bit from your side um 
well, reflecting back on sort of some of the I, expectations I had in starting this field, uh, I think I was um, very much swayed by the much longer history of studying bacterial pathogens and thinking about the kind of molecules that bacterial pathogens use to affect hosts. And I was expecting that we would find equivalent kinds of um, toxins and virulence factors as determinants of beneficial interactions. And I think one of the really exciting discoveries has been that um, the kinds of microbial products that influence hosts um, that we're, we're discovering in these beneficial associations are often microbial products that really actually play a role in microbe microbe interactions. And I think that that's actually telling us that we need to rethink the roles of virulence factors and pathogens, that we've looked at them so much from a host-centric perspective that we've neglected the fact that a lot of these arose for microbe microbe interactions. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a fascinating question. And uh, when we wrote my first postdoc paper, it got directed by two reviewers that said they don't believe the data. Uh, and I think we've come a long way since then. And for me right now, it's that similar to Karen's a little bit, but how the microbiome can produce so many bioactive molecules uh, that can act as neurotransmitters or hormones. So just how the crosstalk, so you were focusing on the microbe microbe interaction, but for me it's, uh, all the plethora of microbial metabolites that can affect the host. So I think that's so uh, the metabolite field is what I'm really excited about. And make no mistake, all of you young people in this audience, this is the biggest change in our view of the biosphere since Darwin. And so we, um, back in 2006, 2000 to 2008, Next Gen Sequencing showed us a world we couldn't have known. Um, they weren't culturable and, um, you know, that it, it, once, once we were enabled by that, it just was overwhelming. And we now know that the microbial world is the base of health and the base of the biosphere. They're foundational. And so, like I said, this is the biggest change in our view, view of the biosphere since Darwin. And I'm really pissed off that I'm not junior. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me say one more thing. Yeah. Not only, the, oops, not only that, you're all going to get jobs. Um, <laughs> that's really important because um, uh, uh, many biopharmaceutical companies are fully aware of the importance of host microbe interactions. Um, my lab, which uh, looks at these really weird symbioses that have nothing to do with host microbe uh, or with human uh, microbiome um, uh, symbioses, um, I mean, it's literally in the last months of their PhD, um, they already have positions also in industry. So I think the future is bright um, for anyone that is working on host microbe interactions. That's the kind of positive message I guess we currently need. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna do something very annoying now and ask you the reverse question, which is, is there any hypothesis you had maybe 10 or 20 years ago that you currently no longer believe? <laughs> Your pet hypothesis that turned out to be not true? I'll start. Uh, we, we, we thought that we could use bacteria as biomarkers. And I think that was way too simplistic because they vary tremendously in an individual over time. You know, so, so the effect size you have to have to use it as a biomarker is, is, will be super hard. So that's why, why I founded my first 10 years as a, as a faculty position and I stopped writing that my grants. Uh, so I would say practically almost every hypothesis I had 20 years ago is no longer true. <laughs> but I would say there were 3 million other discoveries 
uh, together with my group that I made that turned out to at least be publishable. Uh, so I don't, uh, uh, in my research or in our research, um, the, one of the beauties of biology is you can have all sorts of different directions. Some are hypothesis driven, some are observational and looking at that in detail. And so what the host microbe world has to offer is that it's such a novel new world that everything we observe is exciting. Honestly, I mean, we heard that today already in the talks. Um, it's like, that's fascinating, that's fascinating, and let's move beyond uh, model systems to what is going on. So I think um, I would argue I, um, I don't care about what I thought five years ago. What I care about is what popped up in the data that I'm looking at that I find fascinating and would like to pursue. Yeah, I think that um, lots, of, lots has changed uh, in the time that we've been doing this. And, and uh, one of the things that um, we found early on was that bacteria drive circadian rhythms. And I thought, ah, oh, you know, this is only in this little squid, ridiculous squid. And, um, and the, the idea that it might, that sort of thing, or various, like Thomas Bosch has found, that amps might control the structure of the community and so on and so forth, might be evolutionarily conserved I just, it just didn't pass my mind. And the reason was because, like I said before, I mean, we were studying, you know, we were in a backwater field and all these weird independent things had happened. But when you think about it, uh, microbial interactions with animals as they evolved happened, all animal body plans evolved in the oceans. And so all of the laws were settled there, in my opinion. Almost all of the major ones were settled there. And so, um, you know, it's probably one of the most ancient things. And that's why model systems are so powerful in, in symbiosis is because one of the most ancient things is to, for animals to, animal evolution to be driven by symbiosis and, and for um, animal biology during the ontogeny of a given individual to be driven by symbiosis. Okay, again, as a, Microbiologist, when I started my career, I felt if I want to be successful, get my grants and get my data published, I should focus on bacterial pathogens because this is what everybody is uh, interested in, on infections. Yeah? And this notion is changing and has a lot changed yeah? with the notion that with some exceptions, like a tuberculosis uh, agent, right? Most of the pathogens are most of the time behaving as a member of our microbiomes. And if we want to understand them, if we want to get rid of them, control them, we have to look at all the other bacteria. That puts all the commensals, even if you're focused on pathogens and infections, into a very important position. And this is what we are doing now. Yeah? I left Staphylococcus aureus, not completely, which I started with. Now we are looking a lot into skin and nose commensals and most of the best uh, papers that we published were on these commensal bacteria. So if you are a microbiologist or you think about it, don't be worried of commensals with all the weird names and the weird growth conditions. This is the future. Um, well, when I think about the hypotheses that I held and then um, had to uh, give up because I proved them wrong, um, the, th the constant theme is that I was biased by a myopic human centric view. And so I always assumed that the host would have more control over the situation. And I was always disproven wrong whenever I sort of did not give credit to the microbes in the, in the relationship. So I think that's been a um, continual learning process and uh, very humbling, but also very enlightening. All right, thank you all so much. I think like being a true scientist is, is also being able to say that you were wrong. So can I please get a little bit of an applause for them? Um, 
All right, so now maybe it's a good idea to start actually a discussion because uh, so far we've just been trying to kind of like zoom back in time, project into the future, and that future is now, now. <laughs> so now let's try and project into the future where matter organism research is actually going. Um, and for this, I, we prepared a couple of questions. Um, none of these questions are specifically of each, any one of us. So we're just gonna kind of like take turns, ask questions, hopefully get some actually interactive discussion going on. Um, so I want to start by giving the microphone to you, Corinna. Uh, maybe you can ask the first question. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, regarding the, uh, you mentioned it, there's a new, there's so new hypothesis and a big research area ahead of us. Um, but are we all already collaborating enough? So we are many different scientists from different fields, but are we collaborating enough um, overall and especially here? <laughs> Should we always go from <laughs> left to right? No. No? Okay. You, you can answer for all of us. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, okay. Uh, you can never collaborate enough. And the biggest difficulty is finding a common language. And that. We already discussed today, um, you know, how, how do you define vertical, uh, horizontal transmission, heritable, and so on. So I think one of the beauties of this CRC is that you can, that you, you're bringing together such a wide community and can really dig in. And that would be my single biggest um, um, recommendation um, as a um, SAB member is dare to go to places that, that where the communication and collaboration is still on the fringes. So, yeah, so I think that one of the big major problems that we have in our field is that microbiology, it was a very strong field and most of the people in microbiology were trained and have a degree in microbiology. And that field was divided into pathogenic microbiology and environmental microbiology in the mid 19th century. And you still see that Koch and Winogradsky sort of division mm -hmm. at this point. And this is, this is a big problem. And so um, it, it inhibits our ability to integrate macro and microbiology. Um, also the macrobiologists may, at least in the United States, um, get a degree in, in biology, biology with a single lecture in the microbial world in their freshman year. Is that insane? Because we now know that microbes are foundational. And so this is a huge change and a huge shift. And, and we have a lot of work to do. Um, I just so happened, even though I'm an animal physiologist, biochemist, happened to be on a committee at the American Academy of Microbiology in which we put out something about climate change and microbes. And it was great, um, except I kept having to raise, I was the only non-microbiologist in the group, and I kept having to raise my hand and say, you know, animals and plants have, you know, this is like a nested ecosystem situation. And it was, it was really tough. The guy who was the secretary of that group goes over to the National Academy the next week as an observer. In the three days of that National Academy meeting, there was not a single mention of microbes. And so at least in the United States, it's still very balkanized. And this is a huge, huge problem. So there you have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Actually, it's absolutely important that we cross boundaries between disciplines. It's uh, as a life science scientist, we need the computational sciences, yeah. And I'm still struggling with all these things. Luckily, I have postdocs who are uh, bold enough to go into computational work. But for the new generation that we're educating, it will be absolutely important to get them involved into these things. And the other side is also clinical science, yeah. Work with clinical trials, with um, yeah, large scale epidemiology and these kind of things. This is something that bothers me particularly. I mean, we just heard about the fragmentation even of a discipline like microbiology into two branches. Yeah? It's the medical and then the general. We're learning the same things. We're working with the same bacteria, a pseudomonas or a 
E. coli or something. But then it's two different societies, two different institutes at the same university and they're not talking to each other, at least in Germany. And I see that in a couple of other countries, the United States seems to me a bit better. Yeah? But in Germany, we really have to do something about it. And I like to see that in Kiel, that you guys have crossed the boundaries and brought things together. That's what makes you successful. And we did that in Tübingen also. We are still the first and only interfaculty institute of microbiology with physicians and non-physicians together. Yeah? Get over the, let's say, these um, prejudices that people have. Yeah? The medics think that uh, biologists or scientists, they are a bit weird. Yeah, They're focusing on irrelevant, strange things and why are, are they doing it? Yeah, And the other way around, the scientists believe the physicians are maybe a bit arrogant and they are ignorant about nature and these things. But suddenly we see we need each other. Yeah, If you work on a pathogen, you need to understand the commensals. You need the techniques that environmental microbiology has developed. So yeah, that makes me confident for the future. Yeah. Um, I'd like to echo something that Andrea said, which is I think it's often the trainees, the graduate students and the postdocs who are really critical to effective collaborations because they're less inhibited by these kind of cultural divides. And so I guess I'd like to turn it around to you guys and ask wh what have you felt have been the most fulfilling collaborations that you've had and, and has it been at these interdisciplinary interfaces? So yeah, maybe I can start answering that from my perspective. So I am actually a molecular biologist and I then turned to uh, medical molecular biology. And then I was introduced in John Bain's lab to uh, this field of evolutionary medicine. And, and for me, this just opened up this, this vast field where there's just so many great ideas of yeah, how things have developed and might now influence uh, things that affect our health on a, on a daily basis. And um, yeah, and, and, and just gradually, yeah, then I became member of the CSC and then well, I never was really in touch with uh, like uh, true biologists. It was always molecular biology and then it was turned into this medical molecular biology. And now I, I just see so many things which I never knew about. And I think this is just great to see the possibilities and how to approach them from so many different angles. And I think this is the, uh, the major strength also of the CSC in which I really enjoyed seeing so many different things coming together here. But I also have to add, um, I, th I really think it's a generation thing. I, I also really have the opinion that our generation is much more open to collaborations medical yeah it's sorry it's like that <laughs> medical doctors um, it's it's just my opinion that there are, I have a lot of collaborations also with medical doctors that are really fruitful and really going on because they are also starting to recognize that they need microbiologists to interpret their microbiota analysis because otherwise I just read a paper where they discussed the cyanobacteria as a possible <laughs> reason for cancer so um, otherwise, it ends like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I can just add to that. Um, so what I think is so, for me personally, I think every collaboration um, is fruitful um, because uh, you always get different perspective. And I, I found this very fruitful in this kind of surroundings where you come in contact with a lot of different people which have different backgrounds different perspectives and just to be open to, to accept that there are different views on things and just take them into re research and look for commonalities. But I think, however, we, we still need more collaborations. <laughs> so, uh, because yeah, we, we, I think for collaborations, we can't do enough to, to expand and to take more and more also other fields. So I really enjoyed when I stayed with you, Karen, and in your lab where you included also physics into microbiology to understand um, how fluids are affecting, or aggregation is affecting host microbe interaction, just to take different disciplines, not only biology, microbiology, but also physics, chemistry into account of those, uh, to understand this such a complex uh, symbiosis. 
Yeah, so I have to say I do struggle with collaboration simply because I'm such a niche topic where I look at functional analysis. So and for me, it's always a problem. How can I benefit collaborators? So I need them to help me with my topic, but how can I in the lab help my collaborators? And this is why I actually grabbed the uh, mic before, because I was wondering if you have one single advice for us young investigators and in how we can bridge those interplus scenarios, what would be that advice for us? I think I think that the the first thing is that it's collaboration for me is that it has to be built on trust and you have to be humble and realize what you don't know so you ask the right people and then you have to trust them so you can share what you're doing and one way of doing that is to take the opportunity to change field between your PhD and your postdoc and your postdoc and your faculty so, and try to if you want to do something that you don't know really, to choose a department where they have that knowledge and come with your knowledge into that environment instead of always moving to your comfort zone, which would be, you know, your your advisor's advisor or advisor's friend, you know. So that would be one thing that I would strongly encourage um, to to go and learn new things. And I just want to. A contrast with what Margaret and, and, and Andreas were saying a little bit, but the same thing is that you had the division between my, uh, environmental and pathogenesis in microbiology. The same thing is true in, in macrobiology. If you go to endocrinologists, they will call leptin a hormone. And then you go to, to immunologists and they say that that uh, affects the immune system. So that will be a cytokine if you would be an immunologist. So IL-6 would be a hormone for an endocrinologist. So I think we feel that in science all the time. We like to put things into silos, and biology is complex. So we need to, to be open-minded, we need to collaborate, and we need to trust people. And that's, it's, you will get screwed, you, definitely, a lot of times. But that's why you have to find the people you like and you trust and build upon that. So I hope that answers some of that. Definitely, thank you. So I guess like for me, the question really becomes more of a time investment thing because as Andrea correctly pointed out, you have to find a common language. And you actually don't do that overnight. So it, it takes a lot of time and we're all under this pressure of you know having to perform and writing papers, etc. So for me, collaborating is sometimes hard just because I know there's extra stuff I need to do, which is this translation step. So that that is for me the, the real bottleneck. I'm not saying I'm not trying to collaborate, but I do always worry that if I do collaborate, it will cost more time than working with some more, maybe some like my supervisor who already knows everything I work on. So just to put that in there, I think that is the, I think a major bottleneck for me psychologically and maybe also for others, because you know this is gonna cost more time than not collaborating. Yeah, so, I mean, it goes two ways. So, so sometimes you, someone asks you for something easy. That happened to, to me now when I, I had the group in Gothenburg. And the, and we did the analysis, and then we get back a paper that sucked. It was horrible. Uh, so which means that we put in work, but I don't want to be affiliated with that paper. So that's why I come back to that. Then you have to work a lot, put pay your time on that paper. And for me, that was a, a paper that would, we didn't learn anything. And it was not that great study. So I, so I, I didn't like that from the start. I shouldn't have taken that collaboration. So you have to be a little bit picky. I would, it's much better to do something where, and they could have done it themselves. That's, a, that's my issue. Uh, so it's better to do something. It's, for me, it's at least, it's more fun to go outside my comfort zone and learn something. Because then if you do invest your time, you learn something new. You may not have direct advantage of it, but it may help you in the future. But if you do something incremental, I mean, then you have some, you do that as well, but, but it's cost benefit. You know, sometimes the cost is, is large, but the benefit is large. But when your cost is, turns out to be huge and the benefit is very small, it's, it's not what you want to do. So it's, you, you know, so it's, uh, it's uh, navigating and it's hard, but you have to, tr you have to trust. That's the thing. I think um, one of the most um, 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 one of the most exciting areas that you could go in as young investigators is um, thinking about workshops, meetings, 
where different fields come together to communicate. Um, my dream has been, I still haven't done this, so it might take you a little, or maybe you'll be faster than I am, is that I want to have a meeting where, a uh, smallish meeting, like let's say this size, and as an example, every time Anna talks about um, his models, I get super excited, but I understand in, in, in my feeling like this much. And I'm sure when I give a talk, he feels the same. And so my dream would be, I have to give Arna's talk, and Arna has to give my talk, right? Um, because then I have to wrap my head around what he's doing, and he has to wrap his head around what I'm doing. And so I think these kind of networks that you're building here, and, and having these kind of interactions are excellent for uh, uh, for communicating, but you have to do it right, and you have to force yourself to wrap your head around the research of the other, and you have to make sure that when you're using a term, I agree to the term, and there's a beautiful study, I have to go back and look at it, the closer researchers are in a field, the more they misunderstand each other, because they think when they use a term, oh, I know what you're saying, but actually, they don't dare to say, could we go back and define that term and make sure that we're on the same ground? So this, this, this network here is excellent for doing that kind of, of, of really close-knit communication. Yeah, I'm really excited for you guys because this meta-organisms thing is just fabulous. And I can tell you guys that um, in, in my 30-year career of studying a, a model symbiosis, um, I've collaborated with 48 laboratories um, in seven countries, and that's a testament to how ignorant I am. I, I had to do that because I don't know all the things I wanted to know. Um, but I think that you here at this particular situation have an amazing opportunity. Um, it's just, I you know, thinking about it on my flight over, I thought, wow, you know, I'm going to get to interact with the, the, the people at the Meta Organisms Group. So, um, you know, you guys are, are in a really good position to move the, for, the field forward um, in a significant way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think often when we seek collaboration, we simply need some service from somebody. There's one essay, you cannot do it, you don't have the, the machine, so you ask somebody to do it. Yeah? This is fine on some level, but it's not real collaboration. Yeah? If you really want to profit from it, then you need mutual openness and, and respect, of course, for each other. And then take your time and discuss your project with people and let them explain. And this is what brings me to new ideas, right? Research lives from original interdisciplinary ideas and the more you use these opportunities, yeah, the closer you get. Yeah, but I, I think you also brought up a really good point that there is a finite amount of time that we have. And so, you know, I think it, it is one of the hardest things to learn is to say no. If you realize that something doesn't just, you know, grab you and fascinate you, and, um, you know, you do need to kind of make those strategic decisions about what types of relationships you're going to invest in. And so I think something like the center is so great because you can have those kind of casual interactions that spur, you know, really, um, there's a low bar to starting to brainstorm about ideas and, and possible collaborations that are harder to do if it's someone, you know, on the other side of the globe. All right. Um, I think it's kind of time to move on beyond collaboration. I think that's some valuable insights we've gotten from that. So maybe Malta, do you want to ask the next question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, maybe uh, we, we have some questions here, but my, I'm just thinking about something else because uh, we've been talking now about collaborations and for me, the field of microbiota research and from what I've experienced, it's always been very much data driven and it's it's so fast paced and it's also right now in the middle of, of 
popular culture also. So I just recently bought a cat cat chow, and on on the on the uh, packaging it said it's good for the gut microbiota, uh, which which I found kind of funny. And I've seen like uh, like creams that said it's good for the skin microbiota and everything. Um, so. And alone in, in, in the few years that I've been doing this, we moved from short 16S sequencing to uh, now metagenomics, and this is a really short time frame. And I'm, I just want to see your opinion on wh where is this going? So what do you think is the, the emerging technology that might again, like metagenomics, um, putting a functional angle to, to microbiome analysis, uh, what is the thing that you see on the horizon which will change the whole field maybe again and, and increase deep knowledge here? So, um, in my opinion, this is the frontier. This is the frontier. We're, the, the people in this room, to make an American analogy, you're not in New York with tuxedos on and you've got elbows and you're very competitive. In fact, you guys are out on the frontier and this is a pioneering situation, and in such situations, you often don't know the answer to your question, in my opinion. You know, you get together in groups like this, and you talk, and you, you know, and then you get an idea, and it's really fun, but it is not um, incremental research. And so it's one of those things that we are all looking for fun directions to go, and it sometimes presents itself. I, I think that the more applied part of this is going to, to interventions now, because there's so much like buzz about it in the popular sciences that you write something on the label and it's not true. So I think we start to have to do the hard work, the boring work, uh, the solid work of testing hypotheses in, in humans and you know, do that in several iterations because it not, will not work the first time, it will not work the second time, but we will learn if we do it properly. So I think that that's uh, the, the, the next big hurdle is to, to how to put uh, scientifically and basic science, yes, uh, we, will can, we, we will continue like this, but for the public to say that it's worth the tax money and they want to have, they, they start to get expectations. And I think this is where I think it's, uh, the hurdle. I don't think we. I. I don't know how to do it, and I, and I. I just know that. That's what I think. The expectation is that it's out there, and we. I think we have an obligation to, to do that in a in a very good way, and not in a salesman way. If I understand your question uh, correctly, you were asking about methods, and um, if there's one thing young people are super good at is driving method, method development forward. So I'm not worried about, um, how should I say it? Um, it's always the younger generation that moves methods forward. So that part, um, I'm surprised actually that you're asking that question because you guys are driving that forward. Um, I would say, use your brains, um, ask interesting questions um, because the methods are, um, are um, are so, the younger generation is, is always open to new methods. They're the ones, at least in my lab, they come to me and they say, oh, we should try this and we should try that and we should try this. And of course, it's like three million things we should try. And it's, it's in part my job to say, well, let's maybe try two or three or one <laughs> or half of one. Um, so I don't think the field will move. I think methods have been incredibly helpful, and you know that with sequencing and bioinformatics, and we all know that. But the question is, what are our questions? What is your brain? What do you want to know? What do you want to ask? And that's going to motivate you, I would assume, in general, Okay, no, I don't want to make a statement. I'm going to withdraw. Sorry, I have to, I have to backtrack because there are methods people and there are questions people and there are both in between. Um, but I don't think for the younger generation that figuring out what's the next method is going to be critical. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think currently we still uh, put a lot of effort into the generation of big data for host and microbe side. Yeah? And even in the CRC here, it is a lot of, of the money and the, the work and the time that you put into it is to, to just get all the data to analyze. 
I'm pretty sure this will also change in the next 10 years. Yeah, we will all have our genomes available at some point and we will have, maybe we'll have our uh, microbiome sequence once a year or so and see what is changing and what is happening. The more we understand that, the more we will learn about the disposition for specific diseases, things we may not even want to know in the future. So there are several challenges and, and more interdisciplinary um, challenges that we need to ta tackle. A lot of ethical questions. Yeah? Who is owning what? It would be fantastic to have the Earth's and human complete data sets available and then associate things. We would learn extremely in much here. But who is owning these data? Who gets access? The big companies are behind them. Yeah? Google, Apple and all these companies, they want to go into the field because uh, that's, that's uh, research they can profit from in the future. Not only the um, Google Street Map, it will be Google Microbiome or something. Yeah? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah? And then the challenge for artificial intelligence to make these, this is not only big data, this is huge data. Yeah? You can do a lot of, from it. Um, and in the end, as a scientist, we are left with the functional side. These will also go into a, the generation of, of um, hypothesis will be another level yeah, when we get there. And then extracting hypotheses, um, verifying them, and using them for interventional approaches. There is genome editing, but we will need microbiome editing. Now, this is probably the challenge and the big, big uh, yeah, vision for the future. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, my colleagues. And I mean, I think uh, that probably the, some of the biggest frontiers are going to be on the analysis side and, uh, you know, just the advances in machine learning. And uh, it's going to, you know, really change how we interact with these data. And I think also, you know, so there are, you know, clearly lots of data sets that are not available, but then also just the, the vast amount of data that is publicly available is really changing how we think about designing experiments. So we don't need to generate that data ourselves, so we can go out and find it elsewhere. So I think actually now we're getting to an interesting point here because now you kind of seem to describe that, okay, we're in the age of big data and we have all this big this data available, but maybe we should also kind of get some kind of understanding of, 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 of analysis of this data. And then you mentioned machine learning, but at the same point, that doesn't give us a conceptual understanding, just a very highly predictive power. So what room do we have like for, for you know, new concepts and really understanding um, what actually unites all of us, right? We have all these di completely different topics. And I think someone today mentioned, could you make your model fit to two completely different model organisms? And actually I kind of like that comment because it kind of revealed that, okay, what is the generic concept underlying this data? Uh, so do you have some kind of input onto, uh, you know, how are we gonna move concepts forward and not drown in a sea of big data um, or what, someone in my previous lab used to call data pollution and he was the data recycler. Um, I guess one place I would start is um, that I, th I think we can go beyond looking for um, the, uh, gene sequence homologies to really trying to think, understand deeply biochemical activities of the kinds of molecule, biological molecules that we're studying. And that can often be a unifying theme that, you know, where you can have non-homologous uh, proteins or nucleic acids that serve the same function and uh, elicit some of the same responses. And that can start to kind of simplify back down from this vast amount of, of sequence space. <laughs> Come up with your dreams, yeah. <laughs> when you find something among all these polluting data that attracts your interest and you see a, a um, experimental approach to verify something or analyze something, then go for it, yeah. Yeah, see, one of the things I find really interesting is that we live in an age of attention deficit disorder. And I 
feel that there is a place and a time for describing things and getting a good handle on things. And if you go ahead before you have a good idea of what you're dealing with, sometimes you'll have to back and fill because you'll make a mistake. And there's a lot of, a lot of um, effort toward um, um, mechanism and, and whatnot. And in some cases, I feel that that's an important direction to go in model systems that have been chosen specifically for their value for looking at mechanism that's a valuable thing but in some cases i think that there's still space for for defining what you're dealing with because it's really very complicated i like that you could envision that there's like a single unifying theory of host microbe research where, like in physics, or there could be certain rules. I'm not convinced that that will be possible in biology. And so what we have to continuously do is say, why do we care? And, and one of the things that I love that I learned from Margaret is it's not about the squid. This is what she says regularly in her lab, which is, why would anybody care about squid vibrio symbiosis? It's ridiculous right? Animal. It's like, I mean, we work. It. <laughs> so, so the question has to always be, why would anybody care about the research I'm doing? And how does it relate to a larger question? Um, and how does it relate to a question that would interest someone beyond my model system? So that, I think, is already the biggest achievement that one can make. I don't believe in unifying theories in biology. I don't think, um, at least in the whole complexity from, uh, from what is going on within a single cell all the way up to ecology and evolution, that there's a unifying theory. Um, but I think if we as researchers can say, why do I care? Why does it matter? What, why is it interesting? That's more than enough. So I, I, I can just echo what Nicole said. I went to an after-dinner talk two weeks ago uh, for another meeting, and an endocrinologist said that he, he talked about how to talk about your science. And he said you should just remember three words. It's why, how, what. Mm. In 10 seconds, you should be able to explain why you do something, how you do it, and what does it mean. And you should do it for 10 seconds, you do it for one minute. And if, and if you do that, you can you know, look at all the data that's out there and you can come up with, with your question because you have to believe it you know, to be able to express it. I think that's uni unifying. That's the unifying theory. Yeah. <laughs> Why do I care? Yeah. So I, I, th I think, guess I'm a theoretician, so I'm just going to kind of like respond to this unifying the theory problem because I think you're right. I, I'm not really having the feeling that there will be a unifying theory for microbiomes. But I do feel that we're currently lacking in our uh, enthusiasm in chasing generic patterns. Totally agree with that. So I think that uh, developing hypotheses where uh, we test them across different systems is critical. So um, Margaret and I, together with Toby Kears, were involved in, in, in discussions about, for example, are there differences between aquatic symbioses and terrestrial symbioses? Well, of course they are. They, they occur in very different environments. If I'm a symbiont and I'm transmitted horizontally, uh, then it's not so easy in terrestrial environments. In aquatic environments, um, it, it's probably going to be a lot easier. So asking questions, like uh, a very simple question, is horizontal transmission more common in aquatic environments than in terrestrial environments would answer so many questions about what matters. Is it host driven? Is it environmental driven? So your, your question uh, um, is, let's think about hypotheses that we can test that are interesting, that we care about, and where our systems um, are, um, are are valuable for answering these questions. But that's a different question. That's not unifying. That's saying, what are questions that are super interesting to our field? 
So I want to ask you to ask that question again because I want to under make sure I understand what you asked. I, I, I never specifically asked the question, to be honest. I, I was just kind of responding to the fact that maybe there is no unified concept for microbiome research, but there are some generic patterns that we I feel like there's a lack of enthusiasm for us to find commonalities. That was it, a lack of enthusiasm. <laughs> so, so one of the things that has become very clear to me was Nicole and Tomas and I um, were involved in a, a big meeting at one point. And one of our colleagues, Andy Knoll, said that um, science moves forward one funeral at a time. <laughs> <laughs> And in fact, one of the things that's really hard for us right now in the microbiome field, and this has happened to me, um, I was down at UC San Diego, actually interviewing for the Dean of Biology at UC San Diego, and there were neurobiologists that, that, who were there, and that was 10 years ago. And one of the neurobiologists, very famous guy, very, very famous guy, said to me, you know, the microbiome has nothing to do with the brain. And I said, you know, want to know what? I just read a paper about how the microbiome shapes the, the development of the mouse brain. I said, I'd hang on to that idea because I think, you know, there might be some things developing there. But the point being that I think that one of the things you're alluding to is this is a really hard time in biology. You're asking a lot of what we call lions stamping in the grass, that is big, field, big people in the field, to to open their minds to, to nested ecosystems, and it's not so easy for them. They're used to being a molecular biologist, or a cell biologist, or a physiologist, or a, you know. What's an, the mechanism? Yeah, yeah. And, or you know, an ecologist or evolutionary biologist. And we, in this room, we're people who study the hierarchy of life from the ecology all the way down to the molecular mechanism. And that's, it's a rare day that that sort of thing is done. Yeah, think about generic concepts and ideas. I see them mostly from those colleagues who are sticking with their model and their, their organisms. Yeah. But in, in, in this field, I think the great chance, but challenge is also there are always at least two sides. There's the host and there are the microbes. And then there's not only one microbe, and I don't have to tell you that there are like 100 microbes. Yeah? The more you know about both sides, or all 20 sides or so, the more you can come up with non-generic ideas. Yeah? And of course, this is challenging, but here's the chance. You, you talk to each other, you learn from each other. And uh, yeah, I guess this is the best guarantee to be productive. Yeah, I would just echo that. I mean, I think if you feel that there's a lack of enthusiasm, that's an opportunity for you to create that enthusiasm. I mean, I, you know, I think this, this center is coming up with really creative ideas because of the nature of the, the diversity of host microbe systems you're exploring. You can come up with the next, you know, ideas that will excite and, you know, uh, enlighten the field. So I would like to come back to something, Andreas, you mentioned. So you already uh, mentioned sequencing, and that on one point we have sequenced everything, <coughs> basically, more or less. And we have also already mentioned that it's important to look at the interaction between hosts and microbes, and that we all don't only have one microbe. But how can we ensure by what we are doing that this is of any relevance? Because we look at what we're doing into lab conditions. We sequence under lab conditions, under certain temperatures or whatnot. But how can we ensure that what we found let's say gene XYZ and bacterium A, is actually of any relevance when we're outside of nature. I mean, it, it will take a while until you know if it's really relevant, <laughs> but that's always the case in science, yeah. I think you, you, you need a hypothesis, of course, and then you need model systems. This is the critical thing. This is also the fantastic opportunity here in the CRC, you have these very nice model system. You can manipulate both the bacteria and the host sometimes. So that puts you into a very, very elegant situation to verify things. In the end, you have to go into nature. Yeah? May it be a plant or a, <coughs> or a sponge, a mouse or a human yeah? with 
large scale association analysis, you will epidemiology or yeah, whatever ecological uh, methods you're using, you can learn if this has any relevance. <laughs> Do you want it? No. I said yeah, so this, this is a question that I think about a lot um, because uh, in the Max Planck Society, um, if, if you don't have a what they call a mechanistic understanding of processes, it's, it's not worth anything. That means if you're working in nature, um, where um, have fun with knocking out genes in non-genetically modifiable systems, non-culturable organisms, um, you're never going to be mechanistic. Except we argue we are mechanistic because we're trying to identify the mechanisms behind our non-cultivable organisms. I think one of the most exciting areas are those where we're trying to exactly find the borders. So I'm excited about the Sinorebditas field going out into the wild and looking at the species that occur in the wild, trying to bring them back into the lab and not culture them, um, how should I say it, not to create mutants um, that they again keep in the lab for 200 generations or longer. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I think it's one of the most exciting cross avenues that we have is combining model organisms with non-model organisms and, and, and trying to interface that, that combination. People uh, that are working on Drosophila are going out to Hawaii to collect different uh, Drosophila species and look at their microbiomes and how does that compare. Um, you can also say that with CRISPR-Cas methods, with all these sequencing methods, we're able with our non-genetically tractable um, organisms also to achieve more. So that interface is actually, I think, one of the most exciting fields moving forward, where we also no longer fight each other, like, oh, well, that's not relevant because it's a, sorry, where's Hinrich, a, a Sinoreptitis line, which you're not doing, I know, I'm saying not only, um, that has been cultivated for thousands and thousands of generation only in the lab. And the other side that says to us that are working in the field, oh, that's not relevant because you can't knock out the gene uh, that you think is playing a role. So I like your question because it's exactly where we need to go. Okay, I think um, we may want to kind of slowly move into a last question or a last kind of like round like this uh, because people probably also want to have a drink and do the social activities. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, when I asked you this initial question, I had an answer prepared. I never actually used it, but I find it surprising that the topic of my question didn't even come up in, uh, in our debate so far or in our discussion so far. Um, so let me kind of introduce this. So Darwin, at, in his time, had no idea about, you know, the kind of like the fundamental principles that would be required. He didn't know really what DNA was and, you know, and the, the structure of DNA was discovered much later. Um, sequencing, and now we know, okay, there's all this stuff that we're, we're kind of like unpacking now, right? That is actually kind of driving maybe even the evolution of plants and, and animals only kind of makes sense with microbes. However, I feel like in the last five years, if you pay attention to the literature, we're doing that step once again, but smaller. You start on the microbial scale and you look that all the microbes are completely governed by mobile genetic elements. A topic we haven't actually touched up on, uh, upon so far. So I, would I was wondering if you want to kind of give some input uh, into, are we moving into kind of like, okay, first we thought the microbes are in control of everything but it's actually the mobile genetic elements that are in control of everything. Who wants to try first? Um, well, I certainly think that, uh, thinking about how microbes deal with their mobile genetic elements is a great place to gain inspiration about some of the origins of our own immune system strategies. And it, I think that's something that's really an exciting frontier is 
uh, thinking about that kind of um, uh, tension between mobile elements and the host cell um, is revealing some of the conservation and uh, innate immune strategies that that you know inform how we think about our own immune systems. Yeah, I, I would agree that bacteria or organisms are completely slaves of their mobile genetic elements. Of course, they are affected by them, but they have also ways to uh, limit the impact of these mobile genetic elements. And if that wasn't the case, I think we wouldn't have life on Earth anymore because mobile genetic elements, the smaller they are, the less adaptability they have, and the, the less they can deal with, with the complex situation. The, in the end, it's the combination of everything in a bacterium or in a host organism that makes sure that the organism is surviving. And the mobile genetic element can add a little trait to it if it's too, too uh, unfavorable. It will have uh, devastating consequences, of course. I, th I think I almost completely agree with that statement, except that I somehow have the feeling that 40 years ago, people, or maybe 20 or 30 years ago, people would say exactly the same thing about hosts. It's like, yeah, but they can actually kind of control their microbes, and in the end, it's, it's all about the host. So I'm just kind of like trying to generate some friction here. <laughs> yeah, in the symbiosis I study, the, the host is in control. <clears throat> but <laughs> that aside, um, so I, you know, that's why the, I asked the question of Hinrich, um, you know, because I feel like with microbes being the vast diversity of the biosphere <laughs> and microbes not obeying the laws of Mendelian genetics, we're in this postmodern synthesis, we're not in a modern synthesis anymore. And so the question of how deeply that affects the the processes and the patterns that we see, I think we just don't know yet. I mean, I, that's a great, great question because I think it's, it's still um, something that we don't think about as much as we might. You know, we sort of, because we come from it from Mende Mendelian genetics, we think of everything as sort of set. And now, now we're thrown this curveball where all of a sudden it's, it's, you know, very much more um, fluid than we thought. So I'm going to ping pong this back to you. Um, in the workshop that Margaret organized that led to the paper that Thomas cited um, in Animals in a Microbial World, um, Dita Tauts, who is unfortunately not here and can be very, very um, demanding in his rigorous um, uh, um, um, uh, I'm trying to put this very positively because I do. <laughs> no, I, I, I feel that it's, it's extremely helpful. Um, it, it comes across as extremely critical, but it also gets your mind thinking. And in fact, I just heard a talk about somebody who works in biophysicists, biophysical biology, and said when physicists criticize each other, it, it opens our mind when biologists criticize each other. It's always um, like, oh, you're criticizing me. What's the unit of selection? This was D. Tout's question. Consistently, do you honestly think that, and this would go to Dworkin and, and selfish genes, do you honestly think that the unit of selection are horizontally transmitted genes? I can answer that. <laughs> so my, my field of study is multi-level selection. And I actually think that the unit of selection does not exist. OK, this is a controversial <laughs> statement. Um, yeah, so like I said, I had this question prepared for the opening um, of the thing that I, that I now currently believe that I didn't used to believe. And I'm actually kind of curious to kind of like bring it all full circle. I'm going to state something that maybe in 10 or 20 years I will no longer believe. And that is that I think that a single mobile genetic element may just well determine the fate of an entire ecosystem. What do you think of that? <laughs> How are you going to prove it? <laughs> That's a very good question. Yeah, just I'll, I'll make a copy of the planet and just figure it out from there. 
So the one thing, um, do I have to use a microphone? Yeah, maybe. Um, Thank you. So it, it, the great thing is having um, people that, that um, one has all these ideas and they, and, and, and in my postdoc with Colleen Kavanaugh at Harvard University, I came up with an idea and I was super excited. And, um, and, and, and I felt very deflated when she told me ideas are cheap. Um, um, sorry, I'm not. <laughs> proving them is the hard work. Um, and it, it hurt a lot at the time because I thought my idea was brilliant. Um, but uh, she was right in that what will count in our research is what we can prove. Um, and so I can say I have three million ideas. <laughs> How I can say <laughs> who's been in my lab for quite a while. But, but actually figuring out what do you want to prove? Where do you put your effort? The questions you've been asking, where do I put my focus? That's the hard part. Come to my poster. Yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting idea. Um, I love the idea that there's no unit of selection. But, um, so with regard to um, a, a single mobile element affecting, I think biology is so diverse that I think it's very, very unlikely. Um, one of the things when I was teaching um, intro bio at Caltech to engineers, um, one of the problems I had with the engineers was they thought that, you know, you ought to be able to build something. And then when you built it, um, if you didn't like the way it was built, then you could break it down. And life systems ought to work the same. And I said to them, they're, history, they're, they're the product of their evolution. Uh, any given organism on Earth is bricolage. It's the product of their evolution. And they've had a million solutions to a million things. And so... Um, I, they're, they're very different from engineering situations. Um, yeah, no, I, I think uh, sort of along those lines, I could say, I, I could imagine there could be an instance where a single uh, you know, mobile element could determine an ecosystem, but I also think there would be some ecosystems that would be completely resilient to uh, you know, the presence or absence. So, so then it becomes a question of like, why does that matter? And uh, and I, I imagine that you've got some cool ideas about that. So I will ask everyone for another round of applause for uh, all the panel members and the young scientists.